gentlemen know it is customary in good school work to have an occasional quotation from authority. That sort of adds the proper note of elegance to any research program. And uh, therefore this evening I want to read two or three very brief extracts uh, to indicate another phase of our problem. The question is sometimes asked, who believes in Atlantis? Uh, is it merely uh, the old belief or superstition held fondly by a romantic group of thinkers, or do we have something more substantial? And of course, hunting around in the files, I've come across a few things that might have some interest to us. I'd like to mention that in 1912, M. Pierre Termier, of the Academy of Science and the Director of Service of the Geologic Chart of France, uh, delivered a lecture before the Institut Oceanographique in Paris. For some reason, no one seems to know why, this lecture was translated and published completely in the annual report of the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian Institution of the year ending June 30th, 1915. And uh, from this translation, we have selected two uh, brief notes. The French savant addressing the uh, Institute declared, it seems more and more evident that a vast region, continental or made up of great islands, has collapsed west of the Pillars of Hercules. He doesn't seem to uh, qualify that, but I rather like his climax, because with the true spirit of a Frenchman, he had to really become a wee bit dramatic. So this appeared in the report of the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian Institution, quoting M. Tournier. I dream of the last night of Atlantis, to which perhaps the last night, the great night of all humanity, will bear semblance. The young men have all departed for the war, beyond the islands of the Levant and the distant pillars of Hercules. Those who remain, men of mature age, women, children, old men and priests, anxiously question the marine horizon, hoping there to see the first sails appearing, heralds of the warriors return. But tonight the horizon is dark and vacant. How shadowy the sea grows. How threatening is the sky so overcast. The earth for some days has shuddered and trembled. The sun seems rent asunder, here and there exhaling fiery vapors. It is even reported that some of the mountain craters have opened, when smoke and flames belch forth and stones and ashes are hurled into the air. Now on all sides a warm gray powder is raining down. Night has quite fallen. Fearful darkness. Nothing can be seen without lighted torches. Suddenly seized with blind terror, the multitude rushes into the temples, but lo, even the temples crumble. While the sea advanced and invades the shore, its cruel clamor rising loud above all other noises, what takes place might well be the divine wrath. When quiet reigns, no longer are there either mountains or shores. No longer anything, save the restless sea, asleep under the tropic sky. Can you imagine that appearing in the report of the Board of Regents, Smithsonian Institute? We didn't realize they were so fond of literature. But this points out the point that we want to make, namely that this subject has intrigued some very interesting people. And in connection with interesting people, there are some of us that little older, who remember Vice President Charles G. Dawes. You remember him of the underslung pipe, and who later became ambassador to the court of His Britannic Majesty at St. James. Mr. Dawes took an interest in this strange subject for some reason, and he financed a search of the Vatican Library in hope of discovering among the musty old documents some key to the enigma. Investigations carried on by a Yale scholar, 
and is particularly concerned with the Mayan dialect. The vice president entertains the hope that the strange hieroglyphics deeply cut into the walls of temples or into the faces of mountains will, when correctly read, forever settle the Atlantis problem. So they come from a very interesting group. We all remember Donnelly, Ignatius Donnelly, who wrote a book on Atlantis. And we uh, rather think of him, perhaps, as a wool gatherer also. But let us also remember that uh, at one time, this same Donnelly, under his real name, was a United States congressman and had quite a little to do with some very interesting and important legislations of a most practical nature, and not concerned at all with uh, abstract or romantic subjects. And I found this also, which rather pleased me in bringing it out, did Atlantis exist? A publication of the United States Department of Interior Office of Education, Washington, D.C. <laughs> now, I'll give you the big surprise of all. There is not one statement in this report adverse to Atlantis. Every line in this is in defense of it. I'll read you one example which will be indicative. There is a ridge between six and eight thousand feet high running through the Atlantic Ocean. Deep sea soundings have revealed a great elevation or ridge which rises about eight thousand feet above the floor of the Atlantic Ocean and it reaches the surface of the ocean in the Azores and other islands. This ridge must have been above the water once upon a time because the mountains and valleys of its surface could never have been produced except by agencies acting above water. It is covered with volcanic ash, traces of which are found right across the ocean to the American coast. Now the entire article is in this temple. So here we have an interesting sidelight on our so-called mysterious problem. The only reason it is mysterious is because we have been in such a hurry to do other things we've never gotten around to it. But the importance of it in our thinking uh, deserves a great deal of further consideration. In our field it is perhaps more important than it is in the field of geology or the related sciences. We know, and no one has dared to deny, that the surface of the earth has changed a great many times. We know this because we find fossilized seashells on the top of Mount Blanc, and we have also found fossilized marine life in the highest peaks of the Himalayas. These areas <coughs> had to have been underwater. If mountains rising 25,000 feet above the sea level today were once underwater, we have no difficulty in imagining almost any kind of transformation in the surface of the earth. Now last week we devoted most of our time to a rather specialized phase of our subject, and that was the basic account as preserved by Solon and transmitted by him through his descendants uh, to Plato. Here we have a fragment an isolated account of the submergence of a vast island continent. A submergence which has, of course, strong moral and ethical significance. This, however, we must approach with some caution. We must realize that it was not very long ago that almost every evil that befell mankind was regarded as an act of punishment from God. This attitude has so long persisted and is so ancient in its universal acceptance that we must realize that such an attitude would be almost inevitable, regardless of the nature of the destroying or destructive forces. We also have, however, in the story as given by Plato, only a fragment of something. This story, in order to be meaningful and intelligent, must be supplemented by such material as I just read. Material that indicates one very important point, namely that the submergence of a continent is part of a vast and continuing process 
which has since resulted even in historic times in lesser submergences or emergencies from the sea of areas of land, islands, peaks, and so forth. Naturally, vast disturbances require vast periods of time. Plato makes no point of this, nor does he go any further than to tell us of a condition which existed some 10 or 11,000 years ago. Obviously, this is not and cannot be all of the story. We are further strengthened in this conviction by another logical and reasonable fact. The Atlantis described by Plato was a highly civilized, highly cultivated empire. An empire which had brought many arts and sciences to a peak of achievement. An empire which has mythologically been regarded as a great uh, beginning area of sciences, uh, where perhaps knowledge that we do not possess today was then available, and arts and crafts had reached a prodigious degree of unfoldment. This tells us beyond any question of doubt that we do not have all of the story in Plato. We are dealing with an incident, perhaps the final submergence of the last part of a great distribution of land and water area and surface. For the further advancement of our thinking, therefore, we must pass eastward uh, to those uh, great areas of philosophy and religion uh, where scientific minds, strangely profound in their learning, have given us more of this story, have given us elements which we definitely need to complete a reasonable reconstruction. In the Oriental philosophy, Hinduism, and related philosophical systems, uh, what we term the Atlantis story, which they use other names to signify, is not merely the account of the sinking of a continent. It is the account of the gradual growth of land and water distributions and the distributions of populations upon the surface of our planet. One of the old writings says that the great mother, our Earth, has shaken many races from its surface or from its back in the long periods of prehistoric time. We are inclined to agree to this, that for a vast period of time, peoples have been growing and developing upon this planet, and that it is quite inconceivable that man as we understand man should have emerged as recently as we would like to imagine. If, however, in the course of ages, vast and incredible catastrophes occurred, it may be a long time before we are fortunate enough to hit upon some of the vital facts, largely due perhaps to the circumstance that so much of the disputed area is now deep under seas and oceans. To the Oriental thinker, therefore, Atlantis is not merely an island in the Atlantic. Uh, Atlantis is a distribution of continents. Atlantis was not just in what we call the Atlantic Basin. Atlantis was all over the earth. It was a distribution similar to our present distribution. Children going to school today learn about Europe, Asia, Africa, Central and South America, Australia, and other parts of the world. We use a map or a terrestrial globe in which this distribution is obvious to us. Uh, the Indian thinker likes to refer to this present distribution as the great Aya distribution. In other words, we are living upon a distribution of land water areas. And on this uh, distribution, we have dark races and light races. We have many nations, many cultures. We have a long and illustrious history. We have a mercantile, a trade, and all these things. And we have continents that are slowly but inevitably changing even as we map them. A hundred thousand years from now, the map will not be the same as it is today, although the differences perhaps will not be as heroic as we like to associate with the Atlantic distribution, 
unless again we run into heavy seismic uh, occurrences. So in the east, the Atlantean continent was a distribution upon which developed and flourished the Atlantean race. Now the Atlantean race is that which immediately preceded the great Aya migration from northern India. We do not like to use large terms in large generous waves, but to the eastern mind this great Aya migration and the classics and the great writings is assumed to have moved as early as one million years ago. Now, of course, as we told you the other evening, the very thought of such distant times causes the modern uh, anthropologist to shudder. He doesn't want to think of these things. He wants everything to be recent and up to date. But actually, we have much to support the belief that at a remote time, perhaps a million years ago, the progenitors of the Aryans, the Aryas as we know them, moved downward from the trans Himavat across the great uh, Indo-Gangetic plain through the great channels cut by the Indus, the Ganges, and the Jumna. And down these great plains moved a wandering nomadic people. This people was ultimately to conquer the world. This people was to supply the races with which we are most commonly concerned today. From the early part of these migrations came the great Aya Hindu race. From it also came the Persian, the Iranian. From it came the Greek and Latin, also the Celtic, the Anglo-Saxon, the Teuton, and finally the polyglot, which we call the American. These peoples all belong to this great Arya migration. This migration moving downward from Central Asia did not move into an uninhabited world. When these peoples met the original inhabitants of India, they came upon the Dravidians, a very ancient stock. And here in the, there in the world today we also have ancient and mysterious stock, such as for instance the Basques and other culture groups, which cannot be traced directly either by racial structure or by language to any of the dominant cultures that we know today. These peoples moving down did not immediately expand, probably, very much beyond the boundaries of Asia. They moved down into that great land of India. They moved across, perhaps, to be stopped finally by the mountains that border Afghanistan and on the opposite side by the seas that divide China from Japan. But in this area there was a tremendous motion and this motion ran more or less head on into one of the great Atlantean motions that had preceded it and that motion was China. And there is no doubt that what we call the Mongolian today <coughs> is the principal surviving type of the Atlantic culture. The Mongolian was an Atlantean and the struggle between the Mongolian and the Aryan in the dawn of history, almost before there was history, has supplied some of the choicest elements of world mythology. Now, while this struggle was going on in a remote area of the world, the old civilization, the civilization that was gradually being displaced have passed through a variety of catastrophes. These catastrophes began in the breaking away and breaking off of the tremendous continental areas that had at one time practically formed a solid land pattern in the entire area that we call the Atlantic, extending from the north up above around Greenland and across to the northern parts of Scandinavia, and on the south that probably joined Brazil with the coast of Africa. It also included certain parts of our own country now still above water, a situation that will later be more valuable to us when we begin to study the, the tradition on the Western Hemisphere. It also reached over into Europe, 
involving a great deal of what we call Western Europe, and particularly the areas of Spain, Portugal, and North Africa. In other words, we have a tremendous land area there. And over this land area, in the uh, terms of a conquering people, in the terms of an ancient culture firmly established, we find uh, the Atlantic Empire supreme in that phase of the Earth's development. Being subtly but distantly challenged by this young blood rising from the Himava and coming southward in Asia, but so far away, so remote, that for many thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of years, these two cultures never came into direct impact. Certainly there is every reason to assume that this is the case. There is also every reason to assume that gradually what we call the Arya civilization and culture became aware of this great culture in the Atlantic Ocean area. But they were also aware that this culture was composed of an ancient people who had become master of the earth, but who had become old, tired and weak, and were no longer able uh, to pr protect or defend the great boundaries of their state. Thus there seems to have been at a comparatively early time a gradual encroachment by the beginning of the Aya stock upon the old Atlantean stock. And this forms a fringe circle of legends for which we uh, have no other reasonable explanation. This fringe circle of legends has something to do with the eternal division of human beings into two groups. These groups represented in the Persian philosophy by a battle between light and darkness, always between good and evil, between the new and the old, between youth and age. And this battle we find recorded in China, and also we find it recorded in India. Now it's been always a question as to how it happens that to many Indian scholars, the island of Ceylon, is regarded as a very ancient area and why the Indian peoples have often associated the island of Ceylon with Atlantis. This particular point is interesting to us. You remember that on the island of Ceylon also are the so-called footprints of Adam and it was believed that the first man stepping down upon the mortal earth left his footprint there. Why, therefore, this particular land should be so differentiated is worth another thought. Over Atlantis, there rule seven kings, uh, these kings being tutelary to the great central government. Over the island of Ceylon, which was then known as Lanka, ruled a king with seven heads, apparently a type of government, an order of administration, a council, this king was called Ravan, or Ravana, and he was held to be an evil person. And in the great Indian classic, the Ramayana, we find the struggle between Rama, the incarnation of the sun god, and the wicked king, Ravan, king of Lanka. Now this seems to be a thinly veiled account of an early struggle between the ancient Aryas and the Atlanteans resulting in the discomforting of perhaps one of the great territorial areas that had been under At Atlantean sovereignty. That this is not as strange and fantastic a belief as might first appear uh, is evident if we begin to study a little bit. Consider the power, the strength, the glory, the security of the Roman Empire. And then how? out of the distance, out of remote and wild and ferocious regions, there came a barbarian horde that overthrew the decadence of Rome. And the culture of Rome perished under the Goths and under the ancient Huns and by those who had so little actual attained culture of their own. Decadence meeting youth the new overwhelming the old. Every mythology in the world carries parallel stories to this. 
and seems to have a bearing upon our principal theme. If we wish to assume, for example, at the moment, that through a gradual distribution and redistribution of land and water areas over a period perhaps running into a million years or more, that the continents as we know them began to emerge as we recognize and study them on maps today. By degrees they took their present form with two exceptions. That in the area of the Indian Ocean and extending out into the Pacific, there was another great continent, Gondwana land, which is sometimes referred to as Lemuria. On the opposite side, uh, between America and Europe, there was still a considerable insular uh, continent, a vast island, which represented uh, the last of the great Atlantean distributions. These two areas, Gondwana land, in the shallow waters that can still be measured in the East Indian archipelago, and the Atlantis, the summits of which remain today as the Azores Islands, these two were all that was, were left of a, a great distribution which may have flourished as long as four million years ago and gradually broke up, scattered, fragmented in the constant motion of seismic forces until at last the Atlantic Island and the more distant and less understood Lemurian continent remain practically the only map details vastly different from our own as we know them today. The legends and myths seem to imply that the ultimate and final form of the Atlantic island, the Poseidonus of the Greeks, <coughs> perhaps remained comparatively unchanged for a long time. It may well be that the history of the Atlanteans on the island of Poseidonis, with minor changes, minor variations, and constant small encroachments, may have continued for 25 or 50,000 years with comparatively little major change. However, in this course, we know that the ancient peoples lost their contact with surrounding areas. That is, they lost their direct contact, and we do not know how much destruction was wrought in the processes which destroyed that contact. We know also from Plato that they re-established this contact in another way, through the process of setting up vast colonization projects, by which they extended out again into the primitive areas around them, areas in which the remnants of still older people still existed, and uh, more or less fulfill the pattern which we described last week. Thus there is no actual consistence, inconsistency between the Greek story and the Indian version. The difference lies principally in timing. The Indian version assumes a much greater antiquity and a much longer continental history than we find in the story as told by Plato. The Indian version also, however, gives us the same moral lesson, namely that this ancient land that was submerged, the demons that were submerged according to the Avestic writings of the Persians, that these uh, were, were submerged because of evil, because they had departed from the ways of light and of truth, and that the city of the Golden Gate had become corrupt with luxury that the Atlanteans had departed from the laws of their great founding gods, and that because of this decadence, they gradually opened themselves to the wrath of heaven. Actually, fictional writers and others have tried to fill in uh, something of the condition of the Atlantean, and uh, from the Oriental versions we gain other rather useful notes. It was the belief of the Hindus that the Atlantean distribution began with a race of giants. They believed that in those ancient times the human being was considerably larger than he is now. And some have gone so far as to point out 
that remains, human fossilized remains of gigantic statue have actually been found. These were the giants of Genesis, the giants of the book of Enoch, the giants of the Zohar, and other books which deal with the antediluvian world. These giants apparently were, however, the very early Atlanteans, for gradually we see a change taking place in practically all of the fauna of the earth, and man is not completely exempt to the rule of the, from the rules applying to other creatures. We are not surprised or amazed when we uh, reconstruct uh, the skeletal remains of the dinosaur or the brontosaurus or any of these vast prehistoric mammals. We are not surprised to learn that there were bats 12 or 15 feet of wing spread, uh, that there were animals 40, 50, 60 feet in length or more, uh, that there were birds that were larger than any bird that we know today, that reptiles and other forms of life went mad in their form constructions, and that this earth was populated with monsters. Monsters as described by Besaurus in his Phoenician and Chaldean history. Monsters of long ago. These were the dragons of ancient China. These were the strange shadowy monsters that arise in the nightmare folklore. That such situations could have existed, we know because we have the remains of them. That man himself may also have been included in this process, this gradual reduction of size over a long period of time, a reduction resulting from the need uh, to differentiate the mental structure of man's life. As more and more energy was required for mental brain function, as creatures by evolution required more and more acute sensory perceptions, and as the struggle for survival in a half-finished world became less and less acute, we see forms gradually reduced in size. We observe the gradual diminishing of animal size, and we uh, perhaps can sympathize with the Oriental or the other ancient thinker who believed that man passed through a somewhat parallel diminishing of stature. The Oriental, however, does seem to like to remember the Atlantean as a person of heroic and vast proportion. A kind of giant, a giant in comparison to other men, perhaps eight or ten feet in height, certainly larger and stronger than those with, we, with whom we are usually acquainted. However, in time, this also seemed to have diminished until today the remnant of the Atlantean, as we know him, is a person of ordinary stature. Now, if we go back to our Indic mythology and our Chinese mythology, with which we are especially concerned, we note something of great interest to this point. Nearly all of the ancient heroes, the ancient gods and godlings of the East were giants. When represented in statuary or carving, they are always represented larger. They are represented as of mammoth proportions, and the human being kneeling at their feet is of much smaller uh, stature and less massive build. Now we are told, of course, that this can be a symbolical situation, that by size is indicated spiritual importance. This perhaps is true. It could well be true in modern or recent art. But did our remote ancestor have the same feeling when five, six, eight thousand years ago he carved in this way? Was he acquainted with our explanation? Did he have the subtlety to make this fine uh, distinction, using size to represent spiritual achievement alone, it is unlikely. It is more likely that he was basing his art concept either upon legend or lore, which related to the actual existence of giants or of persons of extraordinary stature. In almost every instance, reference to peoples or tribes or nations that could have been Atlantis 
indicate these gigantic uh, persons, these giants. And these giants are the ones that passed away in limbo long ago. And the later Atlanteans certainly did not have such proportions. The next thing that is important to us is to remember Plato's remark that the Atlanteans were the first to wage war. So let us go back a little bit, both in the East and West, perhaps uh, definitely in the East, to see about these wars. Now, we know in the Bible, for example, that there is a report of a war in heaven. We do not say that this war in heaven necessarily reply, ref, uh, refers to the Atlantic situation. But we have a long prehistoric mythological tradition of war. War fought in remote times. And even as these legends go backward, these warriors do not fight with clubs and stone axes. And in your ancient mythological representations of prehistoric war, we have the gods fighting. We have heroic beings hurling thunderbolts. We have magnificent creatures in gilded armor and in bronze mail riding upon war chariots in the sky. We have great armies moving, not as Bushmen or as some aborigine, but the armies of light and darkness, the armies of good and evil, the armies of Michael the Archangel, splendid, magnificent productions of artistry at a time when, according to our modern thinking, these people should have been wandering around in fur robes, if any, uh, wielding stone axes. What about these ancient wars that were fought before the earth was formed, according to the Indian tradition? Wars for space, wars for earth and sky, wars between the Suras and the Asuras, wars between the Rishas and the Arhats of magic and the awful sorcerers and demons that dwelt in the dark underworld. These wars were splendid campaigns, and they went back a very long way. There is no history that does not have them. There is no legendary that does not remember them. And the fact that these legends were written, compiled, or memorized three or four thousand years ago has no difference. These wars were always fought long ago, even then. Far before the dawn of history, before there were men, there were monsters and giants fighting in the earth and in the sky, like the Greek titans and the strange emblematic and symbolic Hyperboreans that came down from the winds of the north and against whom the Greeks felt so great a terror. All this seems to bespeak something that is not just what we have generally assumed it to be. We cannot just simply say that all these ancient wars recorded in China, in Japan, in Persia, in India, in Egypt, Babylonia, that all these ancient wars are just myths. Why should they be? Why should we imagine that our more remote ancestors who did not have our psychological complications or our addiction uh, to romantic dramatizations, why should they have done this? Why should they have all done the same thing? And why should these wars always come long before the foundation of the nations which we are immediately considering? These wars came in the, in the East before India. They came in the Near East before Persia and Babylon. They came in North Africa before Thebes and Memphis and the rise of the dynastic kingdoms of Egypt always long ago, far away, the gods and demons fought. And even in some cases, there came out of the new races heroes who fought the old demons, who fought the dragons that guarded the treasures of the earth. And out of the struggle between giants, monsters, and men, there came what Carlyle calls the hero myth. The myth of the modern man as we know him, defending himself against terrors and horrors that we 
have no actual record of. Where do these psychological stories come from? Let us assume that they do represent, as some of our psychologists would have us believe, kind of archetypal dreams. Yet others of our psychologists insist that man cannot dream of something for which there is no reality somewhere. That he borrows from his environment and from his memory and from the traditions of his people these things which he will grab gradually metamorphose into personal dreams of his own. This is largely the concept of Jung in his work on psychology and alchemy. It is the concept that man is borrowing archetypal symbolism. But where was the archetype? Where was the archetype for the war in heaven? Unless to man it represented some mysterious occurrence in the dawn of himself. An occurrence that is so remembered that like the deluge it is scattered everywhere throughout the world. We know that the Egyptians have their story of the deluge. That it is upon the totem poles of the totem Indians of our northwest that the uh, Hopis and Navajos have their legend of how their ancestors came up through the earth on corn stalks or reeds to escape the rising of the waters, which were the results of the anger of gods who dwelt under the earth. Their symbolism is preserved for us in their elaborate sand paintings and in many of their more interesting and important rugs and weavings. We also know that in the valley of the Euphrates we have the same, and there are marks of water erosion nearly 200 feet above the ground on the outer face of the great pyramid of Giza. We know that the Sahara was underwater. We know that the Gobi of Mongolia was underwater. And how are we going to fit the circumstances of these strange records into this history which we mentioned to you before as belonging to once upon a time? A fairy story. A story which, however, lingers within the subconscious of man. If we believe that it is possible, genetically, for man's past, the collective past of his race, to be reborn through him in his subconscious memories, it is quite possible that locked within ourselves is the symbolism of the lost world to which we once belonged. If we relieve in rebirth, the same concept may be locked within the psychic being that moves from life to life. For if there was an Atlantis and we are reborn, then we were the Atlanteans. This would give us uh, a considerable food for thought. I might point out that as from our environment we attain certain inevitable conditionings, that from the greater geological environment of our world, the entire Anthropos, the total body of man, has been conditioned since before the dawn of time. His conscious memory has no record, but what we call archetype may well be the dream locked in himself, the dream of terrible memory, memory that gradually breaks through here and there in some sensitive or unusual person, the dream which perhaps was rescued by priests and sages from long ago and was locked in their ancient stories, fables, and histories. In any event, we are dealing with a very intense psychological problem, one that we cannot easily uh, overlook. Now, in India, the first official avatar of Vishnu, we know that the deity, Vishnu, the personification and extension and embodiment of the great being who rules all things in space, the sovereign power, that Vishnu, taking upon himself the body of a fish, and call later in the sacred writings the one who was born from the fish's mouth took upon himself this form in order that he might rescue a good man. So we'll go to the Hindu myth and see what we can make out of it. A long time ago uh, the world was ruled over by the gods and peoples were true to the gods and loved them and served them. And finally evil came, and selfishness, and pride. And in the beginning of the Dark Age, evil became so completely rampant upon the earth that the spiritual truths were no longer regarded. And at that time a demon arose 
who stole away the sacred book of the law and carried it and hid it in the depths of the ocean. This demon who stole the Veda, or the law, taking away from man the light of truth, sought to enslave man with error, with false doctrines, and to lead him into bondage and servitude to the selfishness and arrogance of mortal kings. And when it seemed an obvious that great trouble and great catastrophe was inevitable, there was a good man among these people, and the gods came to this good man and told him that he should build a boat, and that in this boat he should take himself and his wife and their three sons and their three daughters, or daughters-in-law, the eight persons, and that they were to build this boat, and when the deluge came, they were to float upon the surface of the water. And Vishnu, in the form of the great fish, <coughs> took the rope or cord and steered the boat through the sea and brought it and finally to safe landing. And then Vishnu, descending as a fish into the sea, fought with the great demon that had stolen away the law, destroyed the demon and rescued the Vedas and brought them back, that the new people of the new world, populated by the good man and his family, might then have again a golden age of truth. Now, we do not know the date of this writing, but we know that it is considerably earlier than the, uh, than the legend of Noah. And yet the legend is exactly, uh, essentially, and basically the same. Now, in the Chinese writings, we have an also a very important legend. For in ancient times, the same thing happened in China. And when in the great cyclic life, the day of the great darkness came, the Chinese prophet and sage, who had been instructed by the gods, fashioned a boat. And into this boat he, he went for safety, taking with him his wife, their three sons, and the sons' wives. These eight, then in this ship, floated over the oblivion. And these eight are now referred to as the eight essential trigrams or the basic diagrams of the I Ching, or Classic of Change, the great divinational book of science known to the Chinese. Well, they consist of yin and yang, the broken and the whole line, which are, of course, the wife of this patriarch and the patriarch himself, and the three uh, positive diagrams and the three negative diagrams, which represent the sons and their wives. <coughs> These eight diagrams... Uh, by multiplication becomes 64, 8 times 8. And these, as Confucius said, are the roots of all knowledge upon the earth. And out of this darkness, out of the great tra tragedy, rose again the eternal teacher, Fu He, born from the fish's mouth, who became the first human emperor, and upon whose, uh, from whose dynasty the great uh, empire of China claims descent. And Fu He is represented usually by a face standing or rising from a mountain, carrying in one hand the brush and making with the brush the strokes, the eight diagrams, which are the basis of all learning. This story is very often repeated in Chinese folklore, and while we've abridged it considerably, I think it parallels closely enough with the Indian story and with the uh, Noah legend, which is of course deep in the mythology of the Valley of the Euphrates, uh, that uh, we have very little reason to question uh, the essential principles involved. Thus we have at the roots of peoples everywhere the deluge, the great darkness that descended upon the earth. Now in the early uh, uh, writings as preserved in the book of Genesis, the word deluge, as we find it in the Bible, does not necessarily mean a flood of water. It means an oblivion, a darkness, a horrible catastrophe, a catastrophe of some kind, a sort of drowning out in space. It may or may not represent actual water. In most of the legends, the type of term used will have the same general meaning. It can mean either water or oblivion. In the Chinese, it is called the water of oblivion. Now, this you can uh, translate as you want, but it does not necessarily signify merely water. It means 
the blotting out, uh, the destruction, the sweeping away, the complete obscuration of a kind of life or a way of life or some pattern involving the removal of a culture or a people. If this legend then has some foundation in a belief or in a valid doctrine, we then perhaps can appreciate why the uh, Hindu, in thinking of this, also makes this their nor or their patriot to be the founder of a new racial order, a new pattern of life, a new dispensation of peoples, and that from him descend a new kind of world, a world in which the old has passed away. We have the same story essentially in the great uh, writings, the Edas and Sagas of the North. We know, for instance, in the Elder Eda, we have this whole world of the gods, ruled over by Odin, or later in the Sigurd saga, we have variations of this in the great family of the Valsungen. But we have the gods living in a world apart, with a marvelous temple on the top of a mountain, corresponding exactly with Plato's description of the city of the Golden Gate. This great mountain is represented in the Adic literature as in the Midgard or middle garden of the world, a flat surface in the midst part of the great Yggdrasil tree or the tree of the universe. In the midst of this universe is an island and in the midst of this island rises a great mountain and the mountain and the island are surrounded by sea and the cliffs around the edge of the sea are the eyebrows of Ymir, the primordial hoarfrost giant. This island uh, kingdom, or a uh, wonderful mountain, is connected to the plains below by a bridge of rainbow. And on the top of this great mountain is the palace of Asgard, also the great hall of Valhalla, where the soldiers and heroes feast forever. Here also is the throne of Odin, where he sits, judging the world with his one eye that peers out over everything. And gradually, in the course of time, uh, according to the runes and the fates, and according to the warnings of Erda, the great mother of the earth, who is to represent, in a sense, the planet itself, the worms gnawing at the roots of the tree of life, <coughs> gnaw through the roots, the great tree, the world of the gods, the mighty palace of Asgard, all of the glory that we have in the great Gotadamarun of Wagner. All this vanishes into the ocean. The seas rise, or in Wagner the Rhine rises. And little by little the world of the gods vanishes forever under the waters. And in the place of it is only darkness, night, and the new dawn that is to come. And on a high peak that escaped the deluge, in a cave, hid two persons, a man and a woman, they became the Adam and Eve of the new race, and they remembered only in their dreams and in their thoughts and in their fancies the ancient world of the gods that was gone forever. Now take all your legend away from this for a moment. Bring it straight down to the most simple possible interpretation. And this great saga of the north, this pathetic tragedy that was sung by the bards and the skulls, this is actually an almost exact parallel to Plato's description of the Atlantic disaster. Here on the great plain of Ragnarok, Odin and his armies of light fought against the armies of darkness under Loki and the Fenris wolf and the Midgard serpent and all the forces that came out of darkness and the ghosts and souls of the evil dead in their ships made of human fingernails. All these legends, you can reduce the legend. You can take away the dressing and the drama. But what remains seems to be the story of, a, of the destruction of an antediluvian world. A world that had once been. And this Asgard, this temple of the gods, seems to very closely resemble 
the mysterious temple of the city of the Golden Gate, rising in the peak in the midst of the island of the lost Atlantis. That such could have been the case, that these legends could have arisen from this source, it is difficult to deny. The stories are too consistent, the details too parallel. If then such is the case, and such might well be the case, let us again consider that gods upon Olympus, the great godlings, godlings of Greece, the gods upon the strange mountain of the north in the ancient Egyptian mythology. What was the heaven world of the Greeks? Was it truly a spiritual state far beyond the sky? Was it a place where divinity in absolute and eternal virtue dwelt forever? Actually, no. Nor is this true of the gods of India, great Indra and his court. Nor is it true of the gods of Egypt, great Amun and his retinue. For the legends and myths that we have of all of these mythologies are permeated with a very strongly human flavoring. We like to assume that perhaps men did not devise gods better than themselves, and therefore had trouble imparting to their deities virtues that were dim in their own conscience. But I think we have more than that. There seems to be no good reason why ancient man should have created constantly and consistently a heavenly world that was 90% mortal. The gods of Greece and the demigods and the heroes were not infallible. Zeus made just as many mistakes as men make, and he had just as nagging a wife as any unhappy mortal ever possessed. The same is true of the Egyptian gods. Re was a mighty deity, but Isis bewitched him and fooled him completely. All these heroes like uh, Achilles had their heels and had those vulnerable parts of themselves. There were constant bickerings and contentions in the world of heaven. Even evil Loki guided the blind Hoda to fire the mistletoe arrow that slew the son of Odin right in the midst of heaven. All these things seem to bespeak that this heaven was not the kind of world that we may think it was. Perhaps this heaven was man's dim remembrance of a glory greater than his own. The doings of these ancient godlings, which in most cases led to their final corruption and destruction. For well, these old sagas are the stories of the falls of gods and of their gradual departure from men. The good gods retired and never came again and were not seen any more and did not walk any longer with men in the garden in the cool of the evening. They vanished away. The bad, the bad gods slew each other and disappeared in limbo. So are we dealing now, actually, with gods and godlings created by human fancy? Are we dealing with fabulous beings living in another world beside the shores of the air that have a real subsistence uh, just with the infirmities we know? Or are these reports of something that came dimly to the memory of primitive man from some distant contact that he once had. Let us see what happens under such conditions in more recent times. When Cortes arrived in Mexico, he was not received as a man, but as a god. Word was taken that he was a divine being. He was not human. And the ancient Indians prostrated themselves and in symbol of homage placed his foot upon their heads. They reported men coming from the sky and from the sea and from the air. 
And when the Spanish rode horses, the Indians said they were centaurs. Firmly believing in their early writings in the post-conquest period that the Spanish, uh, the Spaniard and his horse were one creature. If as late as that this can happen, what could happen in the dawn of memory? What could happen in things that were old women's tales thousands of years before primitive man even tried to record them? There are these legends, these myths that have come down, distorted, but inevitably survived. And they all seem to possess the same basic pattern. And they seem to suggest that this world of the gods that in every mythology preceded mankind, in every region and in every area, that this was a kind of real world, a world that some way preceded the kind of civilization and culture that we know now. This was a world of splendor, of great glory, of wealth, and of power. It was a world also of tremendous authority, and perhaps of strange and wonderful arts and sciences, because these so-called supernatural powers that are always attributed to the gods, this power to sit upon his throne and launch his thunderbolts, accredited to Zeus, and later to the Latin Jove, these things may also be memories, memories of a power or knowledge uh, that once existed. We have been so indifferent in our search for the sources of knowledge that we have been perfectly willing to attribute them to some happy or unhappy mortal within the memory of our own history. We have never really sought to find out the beginnings of our own knowledge. We find somewhere in history a man who stood up and said something remarkable, so we decide that he invented it and let it rest at that. But the moment we begin to investigate these claims, we find that this modest man made no such pretension. And all our arts and sciences apparently originated within the sanctuaries of ancient religion. And these sanctuaries are also the sources of these legends. And according to the same groups of legends, these arts and sciences descended from the gods. They were not invented by men at all. Or if they were, they were invented in some remote time by these strange heroic shadows who have become considered semi or totally divine. Perhaps this is the mystery of how polytheism or pantheism came into man's religious life. Man in himself, contemplating the inner mystery of his own consciousness, seeks forever one God. Yet the legends of his background speak always of many gods, of deities, good and evil, and of the wars between them, and the endless strife that distorted even the heaven worlds of ancient times. Next as important is, perhaps, the realization that whether it be in the heart of Africa, or whether it be in ancient America or Asia, there is always a relationship between the rise of mortal governments and the gods. Practically every important ruling house of antiquity claimed its descent from divine beings. They rule by divine right. They rule because in the dawn of things they had been strangely sanctified in some way as Abraham was sanctified by the Prince of Peace. They seem to feel or claim that they had been of a divine blood, that they had come from the gods, and that behind the human dynasty is the semi-mythological dynasty of deities, as in Japan, going back and back and back beyond Jimutemu, the first of the mortal emperors. Godlings going back to the sun, to the earth, to the moon. The great Rajput houses of India claiming their descent from Rama, the sun god, or Surya, the solar orb itself, or any one of the great spiritual authorities that belong to the age of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, to the great age of myths. Now we've already mentioned the relationship of this age of myths to our Atlantic problem. 
And I think we are fully justified in beginning to contemplate this broad picture of a world that had attained to a considerable degree of advancement long ago. And that this advancement was what? <coughs> Stamped out, destroyed. But that the memory of it lingered on and will always continue to linger. And because of this memory has become an essential part of the spiritual, intellectual, moral, and even physical lives of practically everyone who has lived since that time. That from these have come the symbols and the great teachings and the great beliefs. Now in the light of the same thing, let us assume for a moment that we are seeking to discover the uh, axis or the central theme of the Atlantean culture. We have, of course, so little to go on, but we have something. And we have a number of points that are of interest to us. What was the great religious symbol among the Atlanteans? We have every reason to believe, from what we know, that to them the serpent was the symbol of God. We have also reason to believe that as was later used by the Egyptians and several of the early Phoenician historians and Roman historians were convinced, as we mentioned before, that the Egyptians were the Atlanteans who could not go home because of the destruction of their land after their invasion of Athens or attempt to invade Athens. The royal symbol of the Egyptians was the serpent coiled upon the forehead of the solar crown. And in the crowning of the Egyptian pharaoh, the crown of the north and south, was always adorned by a coiled serpent placed directly in the center of the forehead above the nose. This symbol also comes to us from the great serpent balustrades of Angkor Wat. <coughs> And on the Angkor Wat symbols, and in many other parts of India, including the serpent of eternal time upon which Vishnu sleeps in the ancient uh, Vishnu Puranic literature, we always have a serpent with seven heads. Now Plato tells us that the Atlantic continent was composed of seven principal islands, over which rule seven princes. We have already learned of the seven heads of Ravan, king of Lanka, the Indian Atlantis. We have also constant reference to this peculiar septenary, the septenary of creating gods at the dawn of things. And we have the seven-headed Naga. We have the mysterious symbol, which many have firm conviction, must have originally represented deity in the ancient Atlantean rites. We also know that this serpent appears wherever we have the motion of the so-called Atlantean or Mongolian culture. We have the mysterious serpents of Gobi. We have the serpent in the symbolism of Tibet and China. We have the serpent gradually metamorphosed into the five-clawed dragon, the imperial symbol of China. A strange and wonderful emblem. We know that the dragon lore and the dragon symbol came more and more to be associated with the magician and the sorcerer. We also have the mysterious serpents of Latin America. Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, was a good deity, not an evil one. We have the mysterious stone heads. We have the rattlesnake ceremony with the rattlesnake as the messenger between man and the earth in the rites of the Kichis and other tribes of uh, the southwest part of, uh, of the southwest part of our continent. Uh, we have it among the Zunis and the Hopis and even among the Navajo peoples. These symbolisms of the serpent, the serpent with a raised head, we have generally associated with the serpent of evil. But even in the Bible, we are told, be wise as serpents and as gentle as doves harmless as doves. The combination of the bird and the serpent, the feathered serpent of Gobi, Mongolia, the flying seraphs, the symbols always of the ancient initiate kings, the symbols of the secret masters of magic in ancient times. And it is believed that by this 
the Druids, who received it also, and used it twisted as a serpent symbol around the Orphic egg. That among these ancient peoples, this symbol had to do with the magnetic field of the earth. To them, the serpent was the symbol of pure life. To them, it was also the symbol of energy and of power and the control of power and the directing of energy <coughs> seems to have had something to do with the rising wisdom of the old Atlantean savants or priests. There is the consistent and continuous report that among these peoples certain sciences were advanced until man, having attained to a level of knowledge greater than his morality, having come into a power greater than his virtue, turned this power to the exploitation of his own kind and gradually through skill devised methods which unbalanced uh, the natural equilibrium of natural elements and as a result of that loosed the great volcanic fires upon himself. When the uh, priests discussed with Solon the mystery of the lost Atlantis they told him that it was destroyed by fire but that there would be another race rise that would be destroyed by an invisible power moving in the air. We have uh, remembered this legend, we have thought about it, and we cannot but wonder if the strange power that brings death in the air is not close uh, to some of the things that we are presently concerned with. Now in the last 25 years, the problem of Atlantis has come of great importance. But it goes back earlier than that. I can say rather safely, I think, that from the time of the Neoplatonists of Alexandria to the rise of Francis Bacon in the 17th century, one heard very little about Atlantis. Men at that time were concerned with it only as the possibility of a land to be explored in the West. It came to be associated with the islands of the Hesperides. It became also the blessed land and the land of hope and efforts were made to uh, uh, parallel it with the mysterious land to which King Arthur was taken after he was mortally wounded at the Battle of Camelon. Actually, however, philosophically, Atlantis was not given much consideration except as a problem of possible crisis in navigation. However, with the rise of science, with the beginning of a new way of life, we see Lord Bacon beginning to sound certain warnings. We see him uh, using the symbol of Atlantis as a means of distinguishing a new empire that was to rise in the Western Hemisphere. A world of science, a world of progress a world built around the dawn of the great scientific humanistic instrument of logic and reason which we know today. In other words, the whole theory, the whole system was locked in the concept of the great scientific method. The method by which we would learn to wrest the secrets of nature from her. In which we would have power, power perhaps, more dangerous than we could possibly know. As time went on and man in the West became ever more scientific and ever more progressive in these things, the interest in Atlantis has correspondingly increased. It seems that perhaps this continent was submerged not only beneath the waters of an ocean but within or beneath the subconscious ocean of ourselves. That somewhere in the sub conscious part of our own nature, the warning of Atlantis still resides. And as our d days of progress become more rapid, we become more and more conscious of a world that once vanished away, and the possibility of our repeating this catastrophe in our own generation and in our own way of life. If this, if this is the case, it seems that a subconscious association mechanism is operating. For every day, the interest in the mystery of Atlantis increases, and this fatal interest is locked with the circumstances, circumstances which caused the destruction of that ancient continent. 
How then shall we go a little further with the Atlantean religion? I think we may safely say that from the remnants that we have in various parts of the world, remnants of instruction, that what we call the mysterious temple of the Golden Gate on the ancient island of Posidonis is a kind of archetype of the mystery temples of the ancient world. This temple seems to have been the temple mother of all mysteries, the beginning of doctrines and secrets rising out of knowledge. There is an ancient belief that Atlantis could produce scientists but could never produce a philosopher, that there was a certain element of reason that was deficient in these people that they became masters of certain methods which they preserved and perpetuated with utmost skill but that they were never able to produce the great reflective power by means of which man recognizes the depth of personal responsibility. They were lacking in certain internal moral sentiments which did not prevent their brilliance, but which contributed to their ultimate destruction. That they were destroyed for breaking the laws of the gods uh, can mean a great many things, but let us imagine that the peoples who originally devised these accounts were reasonably intelligent. That we, that we are not to assume that they were completely superstition ridden. If we assume what ancient wisdom assumed, what the Hindus knew and the Chinese knew and the Greeks and the Egyptians 5,000 years ago were well aware of and have given us good record of their awareness, then when we say that a man disobeys the gods, it does not mean that he goes against the words of some godling on a throne. Disobedience to the word of God or to the will of God always means the breaking of natural law. That is what it always has meant and always will mean. The individual who has a stomach ache is not punished because the gods take a particular dislike to him. He is punished because he has broken the laws which are the foundation of man's survival and is the secret of his way of life. Therefore, an offense against natural law is the natural offense against God. The ancients were fully aware of this, that the laws of nature are the outflowing expression of the will of the Creator, that who breaks the laws of nature disobeys God. This was the belief of Pythagoras. This was the belief of Buddha. This is the great moral burden of the Institutes of Manu that these great laws exist and will be obeyed. Now how do we disobey the laws of God or the laws of nature? The ancients declared that the way in which we disobey is when we use the powers or the knowledge or the energies or the resources that we possess contrary to proper use that the individual who uses well is rewarded. The individual who uses badly or abuses is punished. Punishment and reward, therefore, have nothing to do with the dictates of an arbitrary uh, personal deity. They have to do with the individuals transgressing or keeping the laws of nature which are the visible expressions of the will of God. Under these conditions, uh, the Atlanteans who were punished for disobeying the gods were undoubtedly punished for some form of conduct or action which was contrary to the rules and laws governing the way of life under which they existed. According to the nature of the catastrophe as described by Plato, and also recorded in other, word, in other works. These Atlanteans grew great with pride 
Well, pride might be regarded as the form of disobedience, but pride in itself produces only minor catastrophe. It is the proud man who suffers ultimately, but we do not assume that the proud man is going to be destroyed by a bolt of lightning. Pride, arrogance, and as the Indian reports suggest, a man believing himself to be greater than the gods, and thereby declaring himself to be free of their laws, making laws unto himself, believing that his own will is stronger than universal will, believing that his own desires are greater than universal desire, that this constitutes the disobedience referred to. This is also, of course, the basis of the rebellion of Lucifer. And in the rebellion of Lucifer and his destruction by the archangel Michael, the casting of Lucifer into the abyss, together with the great monster, and all this vast accumulation of heavenly stars, this battle between the psychopompus of heaven, the army chaplain and master of the Lord, and Lucifer, seems to suggest again a parallel to the Atlantic deluge. The casting of Lucifer into the abyss seems to have to do with the humbling of great pride. Now when we grow proud, it isn't the fact that we think we have better clothes or a better home or something that takes the dangerous form of pride. The pride that causes destruction is nearly always pride of mind, pride of will, and the kind of pride that causes man to lose his universal kinship with life around him. It is the pride of the Pharisee of the New Testament who gave thanks that he was holier and greater than others. But this pride even so is childish, unless it inspires or impels the individual to an open rebellion. If it causes a people or a nation or a race to violate collectively the laws of the world in which they live, then such a people may well bring itself to destruction. The implication all the way through the story, the nature of the destruction, the record of the Egyptian priests, and all of these things seem to imply that the Atlanteans had in some way become possessors of secrets of nature, secrets which they were able to abuse, secrets the abuse of which constituted so vast an iniquity that in some way it unbalanced the natural equilibrium of the world and caused a terrible disaster. Now that man's action can, under certain concerted circumstances, create disaster is not an unstudied uh, phenomenon. For a parallel between pestilences, uh, seismic catastrophes, earthquakes, tidal waves, and similar things, as these in their periodicity follow closely upon wars and civil strife, records of such parallels have been kept, and we know that every great social outburst of mankind on a destructive level has been followed by natural disaster. If, therefore, for some reason and in some way, this outburst was sufficiently great to cause a serious disturbance, within the spiritual atmosphere of the planet. It is quite possible that this disturbance could have resulted in a catastrophe. Therefore, the assumption has been always among the writers and students of this phase of the subject that the Atlanteans in some way got hold of what we call science, some form of it. Something perhaps which has been so completely blocked from our minds that we cannot even find it again by means of which they gained control of great creative energies. And by means of these energies which they had learned to control, they abused and perverted 
this power, forming what was called black magic, which is said to have begun with them, and through their perversion, the transforming of the serpent of wisdom into the serpent of death, they <coughs> broke the law, and the gods hurled against them this full weight of their wraths and displeasures the gods being the offended laws striking back at the offenders this leads naturally to the next question what kind of laws and how uh, did the Atlanteans uh, break these laws what are we dealing with we have no record or evidence today although we have legend we have no proven record today of the mechanical skill of these ancient people. We have some intimations, some things have been found that might possibly cause us to suspect that they had advanced considerably on, uh, on the levels of mechanistic achievement. We have no absolute proof of this. We do have, however, from the old legends that the evil one the power of the adversary, the black magician who stole away the Vedas in India, uh, the people of the world who had grown evil in the story of Babel and the Deluge. We have constantly in the ancient writings the concept of magic, of sorcery, of some kind of infernal skill with which man was able to perform these diabolical uh, things which cause the wrath of the gods. As you go back into the great institutions of ancient religion, you find the records of the struggles of magic. You find arising out of the old ways, the conjurer, the necromancer, the wizard, the sorcerer. And these words we use today so broadly, so generally, so inconsistently, that they merely represent uh, something out of a fairy story. We have no idea what these terms might imply if separated from a very prosaic and very inadequate uh, comprehension of them. Uh, the old Indian systems of thought suggest definitely that the great tragedy of Atlantis was due to the procedure which led finally to the organization and integration of the human mind. That the mind was involved in this mystery. That in some way, the mind, by its abuses, or by secret formulas within itself, gained power over the energies of nature. That instead of building machines, these ancient peoples, developed a kind of mentality, a mentality far beyond anything suggested by the extrasensory perception gamut, a kind of mind over matter, a kind of power of mind to dominate the action of natural law. This was perhaps a phase of will and yoga. This was an ancient belief an ancient way of life that man possessing the secrets of the use of mental energy could by means of it attain any end or any purpose that he desired and that therefore that which he would will to do and that which through will he could accomplish he had the right to do therefore the utter autocracy of his own will and the skill to exercise that will. The story of miracles coming down from the gods of the past, deities who blasted mortals with a glance, deities who wiped out races with a word of power. All these things seem to suggest that at some remote time man had a knowledge of the use of mind as a direct instrument of knowing as a direct instrument by means of which he could control the operating forces of nature. Paracelsus declared in the 16th century that such power existed, that he had witnessed it, 
that it was not completely lost. And we have reason to suspect that a great many of the phenomena of Eastern magic and of strange ancient reports, like the magicians of Pharaoh's court, these things have to do with a kind of magia, a magic of mind projection, and that this could conceivably have been carried to a very high degree that it is quite possible that these persons in the ancient Atlantean world were not so different but far more skillful and that in reality they were the glorified aspects of the shamans of the various sorcerers and wizard mongers of Siberia today that they represent the same type of power that we find in voodoo and in Africa, namely the mysterious ability to control minds, that they possess to a great degree this mental science, this science of forcing the universe to obey the will of man. This might well have been their arrogance. This type of skill which we still regard as one of the highest forms and which we hope sometime that we can develop might have been the troublemaker long ago. There would be no fossilized remains of it, no need for inventions as we know them. We can remember how the gods of Greece walked through doors and appeared on earth at will, surrounded themselves with clouds of invisibility, traveled from place to place, came in dreams and visions, and vanished again. That they, these actions do not only sound like the gods of ancient Greece, but they sound like the ancient wonder workers and rishis of India. These powers of the prehistoric godlings were the powers that we attribute to the masters of magic and the adepts and arhats and rishis of the classical Indian culture. These are the ones who walked in the air. These are the ones who could speak at great distances and be heard, who could go around the world in the flashing of an eye. These were the powers that some way existed within man. We often wonder, and many peoples have wondered, why it is that primitive man today still possesses remnants of these powers, and the civilized man does not that it is almost impossible, at least very difficult, for the average so-called cultured, educated, modern person to cope with the mystery of mental energy. He is accustomed only to a practical and prosaic way of life, and all these other things seem strangely morbid and fantastic. Is it quite possible that in some way that this blotting out of the internal power of the human mind to control the universe, forcing man to turn to the wise instruments when he knows he has better ones in himself, this turning of all things away from the cultivation of internals uh, to the domination of externals, this self-forgetfulness, this casting of the prodigal son into the darkness and the flesh pots of Egypt, is all of this some way mysteriously tied to the Atlantic disaster? Does it mean that archetypally, in some way at that time, man for committing a sin against the Holy Spirit received upon himself the curse of that sin, the curse which has locked the magic side of his own nature, so that it now comes to him only faintly and often dangerously in sleep or in dreams or in nightmares. We know perfectly well that the evolution of man, that faculties of a superior nature should gradually take the place of those of an inferior nature. We know that the natural direction of man's growth now is the growth of his own internal resources. Yet we find him turning again to the outside. We find him substituting mechanistic procedures 
for the development of powers which the history of the world tells beyond doubt that man possesses of his own nature. Have these things been locked? Is this legend that Plato told us then the submerging of the Atlantean mind by a deluge within ourselves? Is this thing which we call the subconscious, the ocean that closed over the Atlantic world? Has it something to do with the phases of our own soul? Has it something to do with the locking of the transcendental arts which man once certainly possessed, if we may believe even uh, the most simple stories of our own scriptures? Unless we wish to regard all of these things as fables, and if we do that, what do we gain? We gain only a larger mystery than any of the others. So the old belief was that the serpent, which was the symbol of esoteric arts and always has been, that the serpent once stood upright, but was cursed and fell upon the earth to eat of the earth. That it was once the most subtle of all creatures, but it betrayed man, and as a result of this betrayal it was punished and humbled. This serpent has something to do with the psychic life of the individual. And it also has some way a binding in with the ancient Atlantean kings. Thus in the legends we do not need to assume that Atlantis was destroyed by the premature discovery of atomics or something of that nature. Because what we call atomics today is nothing but man blundering outside of himself with laws that he should be working with within himself to find that the natural and proper way to apply these energies for the unfoldment of his own consciousness so that he shall truly know good and evil, which he does not know today. So our problem is that the, uh, uh, the evil of Atlantis, the magic of Atlantis, was very possibly and almost certainly, if there's any truth in the old legends at all, the result of man's premature effort to conquer by mind a universe which is actually a spiritual world. The effort to, to subdue or to subject consciousness to intellect. In so doing, placing the human ruler above the divine and making the gods the servant of man instead of man the servant of the gods. For this the great punishment came upon him, the punishment of madness and destruction and death. The punishment that wiped away of civilization, a great culture, leaving not a rack behind. Thus, the Atlantis myth, as Plato describes it, could well be of the greatest and deepest importance to psychologists and psychiatrists and all those who, lead, who deal with the locked parts of man's internal dark life, the part that might well have been submerged to go down in a great catastrophe in the very beginning of his existence. Supposing in an early struggle between will and consciousness, man set upon himself the whole psychic framework of his present psychotic pressure. That all our intensities, our neuroses, and our frustrations are due to an Atlantean catastrophe in ourselves. The locking and destroying of a psychic overself that was sacrificed long ago and a still sacrifice to make possible the strange obscuration of values from which we have suffered ever since. Now there's another interesting point that we might bear in mind, and that is that it is said that in Atlantis, there is a legend, that the Atlantean was left-handed. Now just exactly what does that mean? If we are to study this a little bit, let us take writings of various kinds that are written from left to right and from right to left. Let us go back uh, to the old idea. And we find in ancient religion the idea that those works which are the works of God shall be performed with the right hand. And those works which are surely the works of men shall be performed with the left hand. With the right hand, man shall touch clean things. With the left hand, unclean things. The right hand and the left hand 
therefore seem to have some bearing upon our consciousness. Uh, Count Louis Hamann, Cairo, whom I knew many years ago, the great palmist, made a very simple statement based upon all uh, studies of palmistry. He said the right hand in a normal person is read to represent the present state of the individual. The left hand is past. The left hand, therefore, is that with which he has been anciently endowed. The right hand is what he does with it. If we take this symbolism, Atlantis, the left hand, the left-handed man, that which is the ancient endowment, something that has come down, something that belongs to us, and something across the face of which has been drawn a veil, the same veil that divides every human being, not only from the past behind his birth, but also from the dark source which is behind his body and his personality. The ancient rituals of the right and left hand seem to be much concerned with this. For in sorcery, certain things had to be done with the left hand. Magic figures to call demons were done with the left hand. Magic signs to invoke angels with the right hand. The old sorcery goes on. There are some exceptions to this among some peoples, but the prevailing pattern is that this left hand is always the hand of the works that shall be concealed, that man shall not reveal to himself. Uh, this is the hand that doeth the works that the right hand shall not know. Let not the one hand know what the other hand doeth. And what the other hand doeth, in far as the ancient world is concerned, man does not know. He knows that he has come down through the veil. Why is there this veil of history? Why does everything that we seek to know about the story of man come up against a blank wall that corresponds very close with the destruction of Atlantis? Was there some psychic cataclysm at that time, not only visible but invisible? Was the principal part of this cataclysm invisible? Was the Atlantic story only a fable to describe a spiritual fact in the growth of man? However we wish to look at it, we know that we are in the presence of a very profound riddle, a riddle which will not be solved even if we discover the landmarks of an ancient continent. If we should tomorrow discover the ruins of the city of the Golden Gates, we are not sure even then that we possess the secret. Any more than Dr. Preston was sure that we knew the secret of the Egyptian language simply because we had the Rosetta Stone. The possibility that Plato was a man of philosophic insight and initiate of the mysteries used this story for a totally different reason from that originally intended is possible and reasonable especially when we know that a story of parallel nature, obviously with double meaning, has appeared in practically every early religious writing of mankind. What then are we actually working on? Are we working merely upon this simple story? Are we working upon something larger and more important? The Chinese tell us uh, that at death, every individual passes through the Atlantean mystery. For in this, his objective life is submerged in the unknown. That Atlantis is repeated in each individual at the close of a life cycle. And also that every 25,000 years in the great platonic year, the Chinese say, when the sign of the equinox passes into the house or sign of the fishes, we have the great night. <coughs> now actually, uh, we are now, therefore, enjoying that blissful interlude, because the equinox is at this time taking place in the sign of the fishes. From about the year A.D. Three, uh, 325 on for over 2,000 years, the equinox takes place in the sign of the fishes, which is, according to the Chinese, the sign of the deluge. 
Their symbol for this is that it is the age in which the good man and his family must carry the truth across the darkness until the dawn of another world. They expand this, the king, by explaining that in the day of darkness, when virtues fail, when is almost as in the Indian concept of the Kali Yuga, when all of the great values go into poverty, in what Plato calls the eras of sterility, the great ideals of the race languish, the great institutions of man decline, and in the words of the Hindu, every man who has an elephant shall be called a Raja. It is the time of power, the time of pretense, the time of materialism, and the obscuration when again the book of the law is stolen by an evil demon and carried to the bottom of the ocean of oblivion. It is in that time also that the great being Vishnu, which is, uh, who is the savior of worlds, who speaks in the form of Krishna to Arjuna at the battle of Kurukshetra. Uh, Krishna says, when virtue fails upon the earth, then I come forth. And according to the ancient Chinese, it is in this age in which the good man and his family in the boat are going across the great sea of darkness that the deity in the form of the fish comes to guide the boat to the safe haven. Thus, apparently, the Chinese and the Hindus both recognize that the age of the fishes is the time in which the great ideals of man must be preserved and protected by a few, that they will not be popular, that they will not control, that the great and good things will struggle quietly and silently for survival, that in these days false things shall be called great, and great things shall not be known, but that by virtue of the grace of the divine power, the mysterious patriarch and his family symbolizing those of noble insight, shall be carried safely across the darkness, and from their dreams and ideals shall come forth the progeny of a new world. This, accordingly, is also a Chinese concept of the Atlantis cycle. There is no doubt also that in the great Brahmanic year of India, the year composed of four billion three hundred and twenty million mortal years, that this is surrounded by the great pralaya, the sleep of the gods, and that the Atlantic story can also bear upon the great dissolution that follows all cycles, the alternating days and nights of Brahma, the outpouring and the inflowing of universal life, and that in the, un that in the inflowing when the silence and darkness comes, then the seeds of life, the germs of life, the archetypes of life move like a little ship upon the surface of the darkness and are carried across the oblivion to the coming of the new day, just as the soul and life seeds of the holy Ahat are carefully preserved and carried across the darkness from embodiment to embodiment. Thus there are many allegories involved in this whole problem, and upon the greater the lesser has been built, and upon the lesser the greater has been conceived. These things the Hindus studied mathematically and astronomically, tying it all into one gigantic picture. And they believed that all things follow patterns, therefore that to possess the key to one of these great cyclic patterns is to understand the principle underlying all of them. By such concept and by such analogy, we have an eternal Atlantis myth, a myth which has to do with the dying of worlds. We have a small Atlantis myth, which has to do with the dying of men. And we have between another Atlantis myth, which has to do with the dying of races, with the endless changes in the forms and patterns of things. We also, in every instance, find that this dying is due to abuse, due to the exhaustion of resources, and perhaps therefore the Indian saint is not so wrong, 
when he says that all dying is due to abuse and that the individual who attains perfect contemplation and the perfect transcendence of consciousness over mind is immortal therefore cannot sink under the ocean or go into the darkness of some lost world there are so many ways in which we can approach this uh, lesson from the Greek side the moral from the Eastern the Hindu and the Chinese side the rational the strange deep involvement in law in magic in use and abuse and of the great struggle of mind and matter and finally the struggle of mind and consciousness and I think that uh, the great purpose of the new Atlantis would be well achieved if man can achieve the conquest of consciousness over mind that he can free himself from the polarized existence of the mind free himself from the strange delusion which has possessed him of so long this delusion of power, this delusion of ambition, this delusion of possession. For Plato tells us, for these things the Atlantean died, because in the search of them he gained a skill which he used selfishly, becoming a black magician, accomplishing his end by compromising his relationships with the universe. It is by these ambitions also so fell the angels. It is by these same misuses that modern man has drenched himself and his world in blood since the beginning of history. If therefore this solution lies somewhere, it must lie within man. It must lie in the correction of the basic faults which destroyed Atlantis. And these faults which have destroyed every man and every woman since Atlantis these faults of selfishness, these faults of the so-called victory of the mind with its fears, its hates, its grievances, its prejudices, its conceits, and its opinions, by which man has always defeated his search for truth and destroyed his quest of life. Therefore, the curse of the Atlantean has fallen upon us, the curse of our own mindness, the curse of egoism as opposed to the universality of things which alone can solve our problem now it's quite possible that in a moral world all these legends were fitted together to contribute a great overtone to our scripture but it is also quite possible that these legends relate back to a factual circumstance which was the supreme example of everything implied the first and dynamic proof that man breaking the law must perish and certainly this has been the moral burden of the story since the beginning and is still something which we can enjoy considering and if this is the fact of the case if this moral lesson is the deep one if this struggle between mind and matter which was lost in Atlantis and which we are fighting again today is the true context of the story then this drama is the, of the utmost concern to us as a guide to character and as a warning of what can happen if man refuses to correct these basic weaknesses which have always afflicted and distorted him. But our time is up, so we will continue with our discussion of Atlantis next week.